started. Uh, I'm Mark Fleischmann. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Deterra. And uh, let's just jump right into it. <clears throat> uh, just a high-level agenda. I'll give you uh, an overview over the company, who we are, what we do, why now. A high-level product overview. I'll, f I'll focus on one specific aspect of the product where I think we're massively uh, pushing the envelope. And then, of course, we're going to have demos, we're going to have an architecture deep dive, uh, and the rest of the, uh, of the agenda that you uh, can see here in front of you. So let me jump into my part. A uh, quick introduction of some uh, key folks, key engineers mostly here. Again, uh, myself, CEO, co-founder of Deterra. Nicholas Ballinger uh, is the CTO and co-founder of Deterra. He contributed uh, the Linux I.O. Block, sub, uh, block storage subsystem to the Linux kernel. Claudia Feiner, uh, an architect and also founder at Deterra, a decade of experience with massively distributed systems. Uh, his work, for instance, is in uh, Arista Switches. And of course, Maria Cometto, who is our VP of Engineering with a very nice uh, Microsoft Azure Cloud background and storage background, store simple. All right, a little bit of background about the company. Um, our mission is to bring hyperscale economics and operations to every cloud to private and public clouds uh, in the enterprise and in service providers. Uh, we were founded in 2013 and we just recently launched. We launched in April 2016, just uh, a month ago basically. We got 40 million in funding from Koshla Ventures, Samsung Ventures, Andy Bechtel, Simon, Pradeep Sindhu. We're based in Sunnyvale, as you found out before, <laughs> not in Mountview anymore. We recently moved. We have a few more than 50 employees <clears throat> and we have shipped a number the team has shipped a number of uh, successful products. Uh, we've blended the team very carefully between cloud, uh, distributed storage, and, um, and, uh, and uh, Linux, the Linux operating system. So for instance, on cloud, uh, we have uh, folks from uh, uh, Microsoft Azure, folks from Nisera, a number of other companies. On storage, we have folks from Veritas, uh, NetApp, Pure, EMC. Um, uh, on Linux, of course, we have Nick Ballinger, and also, generally speaking, we have folks from Riverbed, VMware, a couple of other companies. So, what formed the company was when we had contributed the block storage subsystem to the Linux stack, to Linux, which got widely adopted in the industry. I think it's an industry standard now. I think that's fair to say. We realized what most people did with it. Uh, they took it and used it to replace proprietary hardware with less proprietary hardware and called it Software Defined. We had a very good discussion <coughs> with the crowd here, with the delegates last night about Software Defined. We felt by doing that, by just replacing hardware by software, they missed the point. What we feel is the point of Software Defined is to fundamentally change the operational model, to fundamentally change the economic model of infrastructure, to basically flip infrastructure upside down from an infrastructure-centric, uh, static, manual model to a DevOps model. And that's what I want to introduce you today a little bit. <clears throat> So what we do, our first product here, is an elastic data fabric. To get a little bit more specific about this, a hyperscale API-driven, API application-driven elastic block storage. So that's a pretty loaded sentence. Let me break that down a little bit for you, okay? Hyperscale, of course, is the model that everyone talks about, the model that the Googles and the Amazons and the, uh, the, uh, the Microsoft Azures have popularized, the software model that brings co commodity hardware to the data center at scale. Uh, API-driven makes it programmable, composable, uh, continuously deliverable. Uh, Application-driven turns the model upside down. It makes the, the infrastructure driven by the applications and not so much anymore, as I said, by manual interaction. So it makes it automatic. It makes it autonomic. And then we have a data plane underneath it because you've got to put the data somewhere. Uh, that forms an elastic block storage. And it's actually a high-performance, low-latency elastic block storage. So while it delivers the convenience of provisioning of an elastic block storage, it doesn't impose the tax of the typical software-defined approaches. It's really pretty high-performance. High so we just have our first uh, quarter uh, of shipping product behind us. We shipped two petabyte of raw capacity in our first quarter. So quite, a, quite nice customer adoption. We are very, very excited about that. How many customers? Uh, we have uh, four customers announced and more than 10 customers not announced. Okay, now these are pretty, most of them are pretty large. Okay. So why now? Why is now the time to do this? And I'm using this quote here from one of the uh, guys who actually about half a decade ago was fundamentally re-engineering the Google infrastructure. 
Um, if we continue with old infrastructure, with the existing infrastructure model, if we are engineering processes and solutions in a way that are not automatable, we really end up feeding the blood, sweat, and tears of human beings to the machines. We don't want to do that. We want to fundamentally change. And let's put that a little bit in a historical perspective. <clears throat> in the 17s, from an experience, from an operational model, we had the mainframe. Kind of, you know, mysterious infrastructure operated in mystical sort of closed, closed frames. Client or closed, uh, closed uh, data centers. Uh, client server was a lot better. Uh, however, it was like do it yourself, operate it yourself. Still utter mayhem, but better. Uh, then we got into, I would say, server virtualization, cloud 1.0. Uh, now we have automation. We have obviously VMs. Uh, but it's not seamless automation. It's not a seamless flow. Um, and uh, it's not a coherent system, uh, specifically because the network and the storage were still outside of it. So of course, the, the public cloud providers uh, broke that. Uh, they you know, popularized uh, that hyperscale model. Um, it is now a con continuous seamless flow of infrastructure. It's a cloud factory, so to speak, completely automated. Uh, and their model, their infrastructure model, is putting the rest of the industry under massive pressure. Now that said, we feel that cloud isn't about so much of the location of the data in now public cloud silos. It's really about the operational model. And that operational model is popularized, popularized and proliferated to uh, a lot of folks, to traditional enterprises, to traditional service providers, to the rest of the world right now. So we see a future of ubiquitous multi-cloud that's operated by the same economic and, uh, and uh, operational principles. So let me talk about our product. And I want to focus on one high-level aspect. And that's, of course, you know, if you saw the previous slides, it's the operational aspect. Now, it's a scale-out storage system. We have a pretty capable data plane. We'll talk about that in our architecture section. But why we're really, really pushing the envelope, where we're changing the model, is in the operational model. And so I want to focus on that a little bit in the remaining slides. So I'll take an example of MySQL, relational database. Traditionally, if you want to provision that on storage, it's about two dozen of instructions to really set the storage up correctly. I'm talking about block storage here. So that includes uh, provisioning LUNs, perhaps multiple LUNs, giving the LUNs the right attributes, defining the, the LUN masks, exporting the LUNs, and so on and so forth. Clearly, that doesn't scale. And this way of imperative, kind of how, how do we do this, every single step, automation, is very brittle. Um, you know, it doesn't scale up. So the right way to go about this is to capture the high-level goals, and almost business goals, of the application in what is typically called what we call application intent. Application intent articulates the requirements that the application has, in our case, specifically on storage. Could be QoS, could be replication, could be snapshot policy. There's a number of, uh, there's a number of attributes, and uh, Raghu will talk a little more about uh, those in detail later. Now, intent is uh, scalable because it's, a, it's, it's abstract. Um, and it actually makes infrastructure composable, in, composable and it makes workloads portable. I want to focus on the scalable aspect of intent. It's invariant. That's why it has these properties. So first of all, it makes the application scalable. So now we've got application scalability. And it's very easy. You just use these profiles or templates or manifests, how they're now called in Kubernetes. And you know, once you have them, you just instantiate them multiple times and everything else happens automatically. Now, on the infrastructure side, we provide storage nodes on standard servers. Uh, they are multi-tiered, so in this case, it's actually our current uh, 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 SKU, our current hardware is uh, NVMe and hard drives. But the nodes are self-describing and the hardware is abstracted in agents. And as we do that, uh, we can mix and match nodes. So we can have different flavor of nodes. We can have, obviously, all flash nodes you know, forthcoming. We can have different hardware, different media types in the nodes itself. If we combine that with, with the hyperscale model of building a system, we have a continuously, seamlessly scalable uh, 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 data plane. So we got scalability on the data plane. Now we need to bring the application scalability to the scalability of the data plane and uh, enable entirely, completely dynamic mapping and continuous delivery. How do we do that? By a self-optimizing system in between that on top of it takes the data center operational constraints into consideration as well. So it, we capture the application goals, 
We capture the capabilities of the nodes and we operationalize it depending on the, on the data center. Mark, can you give us an example of what you mean by the goals that you just referenced there? So for instance, uh, and it's pretty high level, let's take an application. So uh, I'll, 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 I'll give you one example. And again, we can use, it's almost label based. So we can uh, define the goals pretty freely, okay? One that we typically, that people like is they have, for instance, service levels that they called uh, premium, gold, silver, whatever. Now the service levels can mean different things depending um, on the application. They can mean different things on the, where you put the application. And frankly, they can also mean different things on how, who operates the application. Mm -hmm. And so how that is translated into actual policy is done by a policy engine depending on the infrastructure. Okay? And again, we'll talk about more in detail what exactly happens there. Okay. But the key here is once you've said, and I'll take this as an example, that the application has uh, you know, demands premium service, it's invariant. And that's the key to get it portable, to get, you know, composability around it, and to make it scalable, because that aspect doesn't change. So I didn't understand, uh, just simply, so you, you have this application uh, intent, so you, you create mm -hmm. a profile or whatever it is. Yes, it's basically but the, the a YAML. Profile, the yeah. profile is that for that application or for that yes. uh, kind of workload, okay? Mm -hmm. But it's potentially, you can, you can have something similar about different in terms of scalability for mm -hmm. that application because one is a test system, the other one yeah, is a production system. So do you tune the, the single profile or do you have to provide different profiles? Or, uh, no, you have one single profile and then you can specify how many instances of that profile you like. And the infrastructure does that automatically for you at scale. But you can manage so that the scale up also because uh, not, not all applications are scale up. So you, you can have many instances of that, uh, of that MySQL. You can have different versions of that MySQL profile, obviously, that have different, different, different levels oh. of requirements. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe if you want to call that more scale up, that's true. And then you can instantiate them at you know, any, any number of times you like, okay. and you could call that scale up, if, if you like. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit then how scaling happens. Obviously, I'll, I'll start with the nodes. You can, in mix and match, have different flavors of nodes here. This is just indicated by the, by the coloring and again, different media types in the nodes. Uh, secondly, we can have, based on the profiles, very different application flavors. I mean, I'll take MySQL here as a more traditional, probably single instance or few instance or LTP database or a Cassandra, which is massively scalable by itself. Now, all these instances are linked to root templates. So if you want to dynamically change the properties, for instance, you determine MySQL is actually running too slowly, you can change the parameters on the fly and give it more performance. Or you can you know, reduce the QoS on a scale-out application with one single tweak uh, in the root template. We have multi-tenancy overlaid of that. The data is placed based on policy, so it's deep policy. Uh, driven data placement. So if you have tenant rules, anti-affinity, affinity, affinity uh, you like tenants to not be on the same physical infrastructure, segmentation between tenants, we can do that. Now, it's a 1.1 product, so not, I will upfront say not all of these tenancy features are implemented. That's coming more and more over time. But we can scale tenants pretty seamlessly as well. And as a last point here, and that kind of concludes just the operational side, <clears throat> oh, and of course, we can add new generations of nodes with new hardware. Uh, we can seamlessly add them. The system will rebalance, and you can decommission old nodes. So you have a seamlessly uh, roll-forward storage infrastructure. No more data migration orgies, so to speak. Uh, it's an iSCSI or ICER. Most folks like iSCSI in those environments. Um, it's an iSCSI uh, connector, so only uh, the uh, data plane that comes out of the system is simple iSCSI, and then we have a REST API. And that obviously provides data, uh, provides storage to native environments. It provides it to virtualized environments. Examples here are OpenStack, and we'll have an OpenStack demo later. CloudStack, VMware, uh, VM, VR, VMware certified, ESX 5.5, ESX 6 certified. And almost more interestingly, uh, to microservices, where they can really take advantage of the template-based approach. To Docker Swarm, we have a demo about that too, and that will show the templates. Uh, and then to Kubernetes and Mesos, okay? So I'll wrap up my part. Uh, we really bring hyperscale productivity uh, to the enterprise, to service provider uh, cloud uh, environments. 
cloud installations. On the operation side, we're API driven. Again, makes it us deeply programmable, composable infrastructure, continuously delivered. It's designed to scale like every hyperscale system. Uh, and I will say a lot of people talk about infrastructure as code. We really deliver it. Uh, it's declarative. Uh, we, if you look at our REST API browser, which allows you live search and live browsing of the data center um, elements, uh, we can generate the code in a declarative way for every element. It can literally cut and paste it, that data center code. And again, since it's declarative, it's inherently scalable. It's true cut and paste infrastructure or, co or copy and paste. The nodes, again, typical storage, uh, software storage nodes. No super secret here. Commodity parts, commodity hardware, software controlled. Uh, I would say the little bit of difference, we put a lot of effort on making it run fast, on making the I.O. go very fast. That's where our Linux expertise, our deep kernel expertise. But frankly, also some of the design of the data, data plane really comes, comes into the picture. So it's, it's really fast for a software design system. And uh, that gives us autonomous operations, automatic autonomous operations. Lastly, if I look at the benefits, I'll just summarize them. Elastic economics, that's really all about choice. We don't force all applications, all users, all customers to use a single tier of media. Uh, we have multiple tiers and we'll evolve the tiers over time and we can match the tiers to the real application needs. Uh, it's value matched, which means we uh, can compose, optimize and continuously deliver tailored storage to applications. So no more static provisioning that sort of as the applications evolve or the needs change, that sort of goes out of scope. And lastly, given that it's this roll-forward infrastructure model, there's no more forklift upgrades to new infrastructure. Again, there's no more data migration orgies. It just seamlessly rolls forward with new technologies, new media, new network capabilities. How do you license the product? Uh, we have two flavors. One is uh, um, uh, we deliver the software with qualified hardware. Uh, right now it's on Supermicro. We're working with other vendors as well that we're qualifying so that we can give customers more choice. I will say we're somewhat prescriptive about the hardware, the media types that are in there because it's a pretty high performance system and we want to make sure it's a good quality of, of experience. For people who want to then uh, source uh, the hardware through their own channels, we deliver, we license it as software uh, as well. So they can buy the hardware from Supermicro and soon Dell and others and we will just license it as software only. Per terabyte per node per... It's generally, I mean, we have two nodes right now, two SKUs. One is 50 terabytes for all, one is 100. If you look at the price difference between the nodes, you'll see it scales pretty linear per terabyte or per gigabyte. So that's the fundamental sort of, that's the fundamental knob basically that determines pricing. And it will, it's the same thing on software too. Okay. What about data services like Snapshot, Replication, uh, those mm -hmm. sorts of things? Is that supported in the product? Mm -hmm. or? Yeah, we have Snapshots. Um, and we put quite a bit of effort into those, so they're very fast and we, we can take a lot of them, okay? Uh, there's, we can provide uh, thousands of LUNs and each of those can have a lot of snapshots, so that's not a trivial problem to solve. We have that in the product, okay? Um, we have a replication, that brings the reliability. The replication factors are one of the <coughs> attributes in the, in the templates. Right now we support replication from one, for someone like Cassandra who does their own replication, to five, and that's called. In theory, we can do more, but in terms of what we have actually called, it's from one to five. And that's what we support in production. We have clones as well, um, thin provisioning, of course. Um, I think that about, that about uh, sums it up. Yeah. And you mentioned it was iSCSI only, is that? It, yes, right now the, the protocol is iSCSI. It's actually, technically speaking, also ICER, but quite frankly, the the demand of that hasn't been very high. So it's in practicality, it's actually iSCSI only. And certainly we can add more protocols. Uh, Nick uh, here, one of the co-founders has, has contributed with the help of a lot of other people, um, <coughs> a dozen or so protocols to the Linux kernel. So in theory, we have the code for fiber channel. It would only be a qualification problem. The product is ready for it. Frankly, in the environments where we're going, no one has asked for fiber channel yet. But, you know, if we have a customer who's willing to pay for it, we can absolutely do it. Just as an example. <laughs>